So can I introduce to you Gordon Price? As I said, he's the director of the City Program at Simon Fraser University. In 2002, he finished his sixth term as a city councillor at Vancouver, so he has got that sort of politician's view of the world as well. He's also served on the board of the Greater Vancouver Regional District, which is called Metro Vancouver, and was appointed as the first board member of the Greater, Ventur Greater Vancouver Transport Authority, TransLink, in 1999. He's a regular lecturer on transportation and land use for the cities not only in, in Vancouver but Portland and Oregon and the Portland State University. He writes a monthly column for business in Vancouver on civic issues and he conducts tours and I've done many of those with him and seminars on the development of Vancouver. He also publishes an electronic magazine on urban issues called Price Tags and Anne Still from RAC told me that she has uh, read it many times. He's published in several journals including Inroads, the Canadian Journal of Opinion, and he blogs at pricetags.wordpress.com. In 2003, he received a Plan, Plan Canadia Award for Article of the Year on Land Use and Transportation, The View from 56, for the, from the Canadian Institute of Planners. In 2007, he was the winner of a Smarty People Award from Smart Growth BC, and in 2009, he was made an honorary member of the Planning Institute of BC. Gordon sits on the board of the Sightline Institute and the International Centre for Sustainable Cities. He's also a member of the local districts of the Urban Land Institute and Lambda Alpha International. And he is a good friend of Perth and of Community for Perth. So Gordon, welcome. Hello, Perth. It is so great to be back. I've lost track. Fourth, fifth time. I would like to think that the country is on my skin. Oh, beautiful. Uh, but I do remember my first impression because I took a picture. Would you like to see? Now, you have to understand that I came here to speak at a UDIA and they picked me up at the airport and took me down to Bunker Bay brought me back at night to a place I had no idea where I was and had never heard of. So I got up in the morning and took that picture and realized, what is this place? Why hadn't I heard about it? This is extraordinary. And it's, it's not the only one I found out of these kinds of projects. I realized pretty quickly that if this had been done anywhere else in North America, I would know about it be used as a textbook case on how to do this kind of comprehensive medium density mixed use development, all that good planner stuff that we talk about. Wow. Uh, truly, I was impressed. And I've been around long enough and to enough places to know what I'm looking at. So you don't need anybody coming here to tell you what to do. Should be the other way around. Seriously, if you went to almost any city in North America and just showed them these projects that came out of the 90s, 2000s. Yeah, I get you're far, far away from most places, but in the, in the world today where we have good examples of how to do this kind of thing, I realize right away, I need to know more about Perth. And indeed, I began to discover that there was this thing I'd call Australian style. It's this, well, it's generic. It comes out of the development community, I realized. In-house design. Murbeck and Sylvan, lots of places. Well-proportioned, colorful, consumer-oriented. In fact, it almost doesn't look quite real. <laughs> if it wasn't for the litter on the sidewalks, First time I'd ever seen jacaranda trees. There, there is nature showing off. It, it, well, look, take a look at this. This is a pretty standard kind of product that you produce here. And for me, looking at what we produce by comparison, this is very good stuff. Mixed use. Parking doesn't dominate, it's there. The proportions, as I say, are nice and a really good use of color. God knows we produce so much generic green glass stuff in Vancouver. 
It's boring. Again, another reason why we should be spending more time here, to be honest. But what really struck me uh, was the balconies because they were really usable. You can fit a table and four chairs, and in this case, two Barbies. <laughs> it's a functional, practical space. <laughs> it's four by two, as you would call it. Two Barbies and four chairs, and that's what you need to actually make it something that people can use. Now, you just take this stuff for granted. How could you not do that? And it seems to me that Australian style has been successful at taking the values and what people aspire to in the single family suburbs and adapted it to medium density development. And don't take that for granted. That ability to make density something that people who aspire to what they believe is the set of suburban values that they can only find in the single family house squares a circle that we've been trying to do for a long time. You know, this word density is so loaded. It took me a while as a politician to realize what it really came down to. Density is when the car has to be separated from the living unit. Most of suburban development is the achievement is that the car becomes a member of the family. It has its own room. And when you take that away and you have to go to something else, that, for most people, that's a real separation. That's a, a division. And height, always so emotional. It took me a while to realize what it was that suburban people wanted, and that was buildings that didn't go above the tree line. It was this way of intuitively understanding what was appropriate, what fit, because when it comes down to it, housing is rooted in class. I'm going to come back to that in just a bit. What I also realized is that you had made the transition from the old industrial base, the heavy industry, this incredibly polluted environment. For people of a certain age, they have no idea how bad it was what we did to the water and to the air, and how dramatically that's been improved. If anybody has any doubt that technology doesn't have a role in cleaning up the world, they don't remember this world. And we, we were very much of that too. And this ability to take these brownfield sites and convert them into something that at the time would have been considered a miracle, that you could actually have families being raised on sites like this, is a, well, it's an astonishing achievement. <laughs> and we take it for granted because we're good at it. I also realized that you had some key strategic investments. I really found this out after being told about what the significance of building better cities was for you, bearing that line. That's paying off generationally. Saw the same thing in Brisbane. So, so this ability to, to take government investment to do some basic infrastructure things and then letting the market prosper don't take that for granted. And then rail. Uh, I was amazed. <laughs> I don't want to sound too naive here. It, it, it may be that you, know, you go to a new place and you see it through these fresh eyes, but I didn't expect for a city that I'd heard was predominantly suburban, a uh, quarter acre block, the Australian dream, would have a transit culture of this sophistication. I spent all of Monday just riding the rails, all of them except for Armadale. And <laughs> I'm sorry, Armadale, I'll, I'll come back. <laughs> it's impressive. You know, more to do. But when I, I go out there and I see the legacy that you have from this rail system, the electric streetcar, we're cities of fortunate age in this respect. Uh, a good part of, of the neighborhoods that we really value are are very much a product of that streetcar era. And, and I was charmed by Claremont and Bayview Terrace. So I wanted to go back and you know, get a cup of coffee there and see how, how it felt. It was one of the questions I had when I came here. Well, I had no idea. You've turned it into one of these mixed juice streets. This is very, very impressive work. There aren't many examples I can think of in North America that have kind of pulled off this particular mix of how you create a public realm and still accommodate the car 
with a sense of safety. You have to take a certain risk here that people are going to use common sense. <laughs> the lawyers get in the way with this stuff often. But you did it. So you've got lots of precedents and clearly a lot of experience. Again, going back to this part of the city that's a product of the electric streetcar, just as, as we are too. And this is where we separate. This is where Vancouver goes in a different direction. Here is uh, the streetcar village, the high street of my neighborhood. And again, you can see the product of, of the electric streetcar. There are the original houses on this street in 1900. The electric streetcar comes down. And look what people do. They build little storefronts in their front yards. It wasn't zoning back then. This is all organic. People just taking economic opportunity from those who walk in either direction to get the streetcar, and then you can sell them something. Terrific stuff. I don't think we've ever done it better, actually. But look behind. There's two things here you have to know about that picture. First of all, we would never allow it now. This is all illegal. And why? Someone came in, wanted to do something more or less the same. And the answer? There's no parking. There's no parking. Without the parking, you can't build it. And then look behind. Because the secret to having something that thrives economically, and I will say from some of the TODs that I've seen up in Jindalup, um, struggling. It's got the shopping center that just sucks in all the economic activity. So while the design is of a very high quality, I just didn't see the people. Here you see the people. And why? Uh, because of what's behind. We found a way, because we had to, as you will see, to create a density of a scale that more or less duplicates what was there, what was typical of an urban environment in the late 19th century. We spent most of the 20th century getting out of that kind of stuff because it was polluted. It did decline. Often it was dangerous. And we reinvented it by doing this. Here we are. Uh, Marion mentioned that article I wrote, The View from 56. 56, significant in North America for two reasons. The Americans passed the Interstate Freeway Act, and we rezoned an old streetcar suburb, my neighborhood, to allow for this. The worst architecture of the 20th century, or at least the most mundane. And boy, when we unleashed the forces of the private sector, they transformed my neighborhood from a traditional streetcar neighborhood where the highest building was eight stories within 10 years to this. And they were just getting going. There's that eight story building. By 1972, the end of an era, it looked like that. Now, <laughs> if you didn't live in it, this was the best bad example that you could point to of exactly what you didn't want anywhere near you. I mentioned before, housing is about class. Can't hide from that. <laughs> In Aussie terms, this would be a bogan magnet. <laughs> Saw that today in the paper. Density, bogan magnet. <laughs> And that's pretty much what people thought was going to happen to this place, even worse. Yeah, this kind of density would produce social aberration, the American housing projects, slums, dangerous. None of that happened. This is now one of our pride and joy. You know, uh, no doubt I've heard, that Vancouver is a very expensive city, a bunch of reasons for that. But how can a young person, a senior on fixed income, service, how can they survive in Vancouver? Because of that, all that housing that was built in the 1960s, one-bedroom apartments, little balcony, that's still a lower-middle-income rental neighborhood right next to Stanley Parks and beaches and with walking distance of downtown. That is an urban miracle. Thank God we did it, even if people hated the architecture. <laughs> and it's true. It was, it was just basically... Slab construction. It's the cheapest you could do at the time. <laughs> and we don't do it that way anymore. Because you can't just do crap over time. 
People aspire to something better. And if you do it badly, you only often get to do it once. Because people will point to it and say, never do that again. I should go around places now and I look for these single towers. Lots of examples of them. Saw one in Auckland a little while ago on Stanley Point, for those of you who might know it. But yeah, you see that one tower. So one out in Claremont. You can just see it on the horizon. There's one tower sticking up. And you can guess what happened. The blowback, that was the end of it politically. OK, so this one is fascinating. Anyone know where this is, Blues Point in Sydney? Anyone know who did it? The architect? That's Harry Zeidler. Still thinks it's one of his best works. Anyone know the developer? Dick Dusseldorp. Well, you should, because Dusseldorp hired Seidler to do this. It's going to be part of a much bigger project. Was determined that he would find a way so that people could buy individual units rather than just building a rental tower. Hired lawyers, wrote up the legislation, and got it through the New South Wales government. That building is the origins of strata titling. That's what made the condominium possible in my city because we took that legislation from New South Wales and we're one of the places in the Commonwealth that pretty much adopted it word for word. And it was the creation of the condominium that changed the status of the tower and made it something not just rental, not just for lower middle income people, but as a home that people could then appreciate over time the capital value. Changed the status. Changed it as a wealth mechanism. And changed it as an acceptable form of density. And boy, did we run with that. Now, there's a whole bunch of backstory here I could give you. Marion won't let me. About the reasons why we've had to concentrate density on the scale that we have. Mountains, water, border, agricultural land. Good political story there, too. But the main thing is we found that density was acceptable to the entire class system of our society. <laughs> Not just the Bogans, but the Dinks and the Hipsters. And Well, there's a piece in the paper the, where I saw Bogan is the idea that somehow you might run into people who aren't of your income. <laughs> and that's true. <laughs> they may earn a lot more than you do. There has to be a place for them, too. And, and demographically, that's what's happening. People like me. We're cashing out, downsizing, lock and leave. But we want livability and safety and amenity. And it turns out that density is somewhat secondary to those factors. This is where design comes in. So I say, yeah, you do it great at medium density. Can you notch it up a bit? Ah, the answer is, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Australian version, Australian style. Now, as it happens, this particular model, the amenity, the density, the mix, the transportation choices, it was pretty popular. Uh, <laughs> it was just taken as a model, literally, right down to the design of the railings uh, to Dubai Marina. What you are walking through there is basically the Middle Eastern version of False Creek. This turned out to be a, a highly transferable way of building density in cities. Now, the other half of the story is the transportation part of it. And this is where Vancouver, again, parted company from you and most other places. The expectation that we would, like the Americans, certainly, and indeed the Germans before them who modeled the Autobahn, that the Americans used for the basis of the interstate. The difference being the Americans took it right into the center of their cities, uh, as we were going to do. We were going to do it from every direction. And for a bunch of reasons, basically starved of fiscal oxygen, we didn't do any of it. We didn't clear vast amounts of industrial site and old neighborhoods. We didn't build the waterfront freeways and the massive parking garages. And the expectation that basically almost everyone for almost everything, almost all the time, will drive. We've spent half a century doing that. You certainly have. And we didn't, at least insofar as bringing in the intracity freeways into the center. 
Now, it made perfect sense to think about doing that, and at the time it was certainly argued, well, you had to. You certainly wouldn't be able to economically thrive unless people could get into your city and out again at night so that they could have access to the suburban way of life, the clean, the green, the safe, the Canadian dream, the Australian dream. And we didn't. And guess what happened? We turned into something fabulous. Because we had to work within the template that we had established from the streetcar era, that's all that other stuff, within the center, the walking city, where the density was high enough, the mix, all of the facilities that served the region. And we did it without ever having to build a freeway into that grid. So when you come from the south into my city, Interstate 5, to the states, cross the border, Highway 99, and you get to that stoplight right there. That's the first one you would have run into since Tijuana, Mexico. Well, I used to say that until I went and checked. Actually, you have to go halfway down into Mexico behind you. <laughs> You'll get off a, a freeway. That indispensable infrastructure that is still being built turned out, at least in this context, context counts, uh, you didn't need it at all. The arterial grid was quite sufficient to handle the demand for the automobile, an essential part of our transportation system, without letting it dominate. And that's the key word. You don't have to have this war in the car. Yeah. If there was ever a war in the car, it was in the 1910s and the car won. But once it begins to dominate, when everything has to be basically designed around it, when form follows parking, you lose the idea of the city. Why are we in this room? Couldn't we just do this through streaming? Do you really need to come into the center? Why do people do that at the same time every day? Because that's the idea of the city. It's a place of deliberate congestion. Congestion is your friend. It's the basis for economic activity and human interaction. So, politically, that has to be reinforced. You have to believe in that. And in 1997, we passed a plan, and there's nothing in there you haven't seen before. Almost all the plans say that, except for the first one. No increase in road capacity. Now, we can say that because as a built-out city, we didn't have to build a lot of new roads to service new development. But the key thing, and the message to the engineering department, was you're not going to get any money to widen the roads. You're not going to be able to build in the way that you have traditionally been taught. <laughs> As one of my colleagues said, the sincerest form of rhetoric is your budget. And if the money isn't there and you give it for other things, your engineers will all run over there to do all the other stuff that actually makes the transportation system work. Well, we've got to have some data, don't we? Get beyond the rhetoric. So there it is. Downtown population, you saw the pictures. And there's more. Uh, actually increased by over 100% now, certainly by 2015. Downtown jobs has gone up too. Bit of mythology that somehow the jobs left as we've made Vancouver a resort. That's actually simply not true. But here's the thing. The number of vehicles entering downtown has dropped, even as the number of trips going into the center has increased. And let me give you that in a more graphic way. Here's the downtown peninsula. Just at the time, the, for those of you who know the City of the Concord Pacific Project's being built, there's False Creek in the foreground. And what engineers do, transportation engineers, they will draw lines, what they call a screen line, and they will count everything that crosses it in a day. And they'll do that if they can about every 5, 10, 15 years. So they get this longitudinal data that tells them how the transportation system is responding. Typically, we only counted cars. They didn't count anything. And it's really easy to do it here because you've got the bridges and a few major roads. So what happens? When you graph that, you get something like this. And that's completely impenetrable, isn't it? <laughs> you have to have one of those slides in every show. Here is the morning peak. You can see the morning up there, and then it drops off during the day. As of 1960, population grows, number of vehicles certainly does, jobs grow downtown. And so by 1976, you can see there it is, it reflects the increase. Now, done again in 2010, what do you think it's going to look like? 
because all of that population growth has occurred in that time. The region is growing. More jobs. Well, young engineer, no one else thought to do this, graphed it right there. What that means is that the number of vehicles entering into downtown hasn't changed since 1965. And I can tell you, no one believes that. That is good. Actually, that has what happened. But the perception is still that we're dealing with massive congestion. The perception here is what counts politically, even though the reality reflects something else. And trying to reconcile those two is tough. But reality still counts. Because what it means is that if you are sincere in your attempt to actually give people some transportation choices, they'll use them. It also means congestion isn't going away. It's just the point you reach where people have maximized their ability to come together to do exchange. And if you do give them enough other choices, well, it's, <laughs> it's amazing how fast the change occurs. Now, that, too, is impenetrable. All I want to say is that we predicted or hoped or planned that by 2020, we would get to about a 50% modal split. 50% cars, 50% other modes. We've already reached it, passed it. And indeed, we've already set a goal that we're probably going to reach well before 2040. And what that means is that it reflects a change in behavior, just the kind of stuff we say we want. Now, this I find just boggling, I have to say. If it wasn't based upon really solid data, car registration and licensing, I, I would find it unbelievable because what it tells you is that if you're between the ages of 16 and 24 and you live in the city of Vancouver or the adjacent university district and you have a driver's license, you're in the minority. Now think about that. This is not people who don't own cars. This is people who don't have driver's licenses, which frankly I don't understand. As a, as a boomer, it's a rite of passage and why wouldn't I get a driver's license? Well, there are probably good reasons for it. Uh, graduated licensing, uh, you don't need it. Better transit, get into that. But to have seen this change happen so fast and really so unexpectedly, I don't know anyone who predicted this, suggests how, how quickly change can occur when you really do believe that what you want is something you're going to achieve. And uh, from an urban design point of view, now you've got real estate. Because if people don't need to drive and park as much, if that's not what they're doing, then the most affordable real estate that any city has, and the most of it, is their streets. And if you can start to repurpose that, if you can actually close down whole parts of your grid, if you can take pieces out to make them green to provide that park space in higher density environments, if you want less pollution, if you want it quieter, if you want that quality of life that brings the suburban values into the city, you have the space to do it without unnecessarily inducing counterproductive congestion. Counterproductive congestion. Whoops. You can take out parking, sacred ground, for better economic purpose. Three parking spaces taken out. There's a little crepery that those people are looking onto. That business has doubled. For a business, it would have assumed that if people couldn't park in front, they would lose economic opportunity. The reverse turned out to be true. Well, parking, parking. When structured parking garages begin to see 10, 20, 30, 40 percent drop in business, uh, the underlying value of the land becomes a justification for the demolition of structured parking lots. I understand when surface parking lots get used for better land use purposes, that makes sense, but to demolish this so you can do that, still have parking, more expensive, less of it, you know you've reached some kind of tipping point. Ah, uh, yeah, and separated bike lanes. <laughs> you want to have a good political battle? You want to send the uh, open line radio people into hysteria? <laughs> Proposed separated bike lanes. Now, what I notice about Perth is you are, you are not a new cycling city. 
And by new cycling, I mean this transition that you certainly see in Europe that's happened, and now you're seeing throughout North America, is, is people cycling for transportation purposes and not changing their clothing. You've got mammals here, lots of them, middle-aged men in Lycra, right? This is what I see. They're, they're, they're athletic, and they are predominantly male, older male too, but uh, that's not new cycling. New cycling is when it's safe, protected, it's used for transportation purposes, and the good old split is about, well, should be more than 50% women. Once you get to that stage, then cycling becomes a serious mode of transportation so that, again, it begins to substitute for the car trip, frees up the space so that you can take out a whole lane of a major arterial that feeds into the city. Carmageddon will be predicted. Massive congestion. You will do it, and nothing will happen. We've done this three, four times now. Major lane on a bridge, bike lanes through downtown, Carmageddon, doesn't happen. Still have to go through the same thing every time. This is emotional. This is where you do get into territoriality. This is where people get very sensitive to the idea that what they expect about their way of life is being in some way threatened. It's a war on the car. Even though every bicycle that uses this system is one less car competing for the same amount of space that they can use. New cycling city. You want to get to that point. You are subtropical, you are flat, you are building density, you want people to pursue more athletic and healthy activity. You have to preach this stuff. You just want to give them the opportunity to do it. And it has to be connected. Connected. Basic lessons about transportation systems. They need to have sufficient density so that these transportation options work, particularly walking, but cycling. If you want activity, they have to have connectivity. They need to be multimodal. They need to be multinodal. This is all good, good old nerdy transportation stuff. The really good news is that this works. Works great. People really like it. So the development of the walking city, which has been the urban experience for most of human history, now is coming back. But you do have to get to that necessary level of density and mix and connectivity to really make it work. Density alone, particularly if it's just one kind, commercial and residential, not good enough. And then the transit city. These are layers, by the way. They all overlap. That works too. But it has to be a complex transit system. Our focus tends to be, of course, on rail. We really like to talk about that. If it's not being fed by a frequent system of buses, well, you know, you don't have to stop with any one mode. The whole point is you've got to give people choices and layers. Ah, and then motordom. Now, motordom came as a word that came out of the 1920s when the automobile was emerging, and, and, and cities had to adapt to it. It was clear. Unfortunately, by the 1940s and 1950s, it was designing everything for the car. Most people, most times, most places for the car. And we're doing it too. Billions of dollars. Billions. Astonishing, really. Because it's not like we haven't had enough experience knowing that this is not going to work. I mean, I keep trying to keep it simple. But if there is a, a place on this planet that by investing billions in new roads has solved congestion, where all vehicles can be free-flowing at all times of the day throughout the region, let me know. Which is actually pretty astonishing when you think about it. Because why are we spending trillions of dollars to do something where we don't have a single working example of success? Often it's justified for goods movement, which I get. We're a port. I know that's an issue here. But that's not what this is about. That's basically the excuse to justify building more of this large-scale infrastructure, 10 lanes, that drops down to agricultural land on a delta, land below sea level. And we're talking about spending $3 billion to do that. There is something else, I think, going on. So imagine my surprise. 
took this on Monday. What is the argument here? That do you want a more transit-oriented city? And you may have a reason. I don't know. It's a little presumptuous of me, isn't it? I don't know the story here. But what it looks to me like is that somehow you can't stop yourselves. Because <laughs> that's not cheap, just in terms of the land value for sure, but just in the scale of construction. And, and I was here for a matter of hours before I heard, you may have the seven most congested Australian roads out of 10 within a matter of years. How is this going to help? So this is not a criticism, because we're doing it too. And frankly, most places still are. We haven't been able to find our way from this, the Australian dream, Canadian dream, American dream, Chinese dream. Any culture that seems to have the wealth pursues this ideal of having a separate house on its own lot, regardless of how small the lots are getting. And I understand the appeal of it. I've been in the Australian house on these beautiful days where, you know, there's a seamlessness, the Barbie, the, the table with the four chairs. It's a good life. Maybe the best in the world. I'll be honest about that. I haven't found a better way of life, all things in, than what you live. And so why wouldn't you try and offer it to everyone who aspires to it? And I think if it worked, you would. But Perth is reaching that point where you go from the transition of a region that has been successfully building the Australian dream from one to two and now heading for three million. And it's somewhere in there that these systems will really start to fail. I think you have a sense of that happening already. It's already happened in Sydney. Melbourne seems to be going through it. Brisbane is trying to build its way out of it. Tunnels, tunnels, tunnels. It seems to me that you already have pretty much the skills and the expertise to provide the alternative, a better range of choices, while still aspiring to all the values that that represents. So I'm going to show you very quickly a few examples of how you can deal with this problem. You know how to do it on brownfield sites to dealing with it in the established neighborhoods that will give you tremendous political pushback if you try and change their scale and character. I know of no one who goes from City Hall into a neighborhood and says, hi, we're here to help change the character of your neighborhood. How would you like us to do that? They don't. They say, what are your values and how can we help preserve them? And you have to do it, I think, incrementally, incrementally. You don't want to be in a position of having to spend a lot of political capital for not getting a sufficient return. So that however the densities are done, they have to be either invisible or hidden or gentle. Invisible density, uh, you can't tell whether that's a single family house. Now these have already gone through transition. And in the 1960s, we did that version of it. Today we do this version of it. Those are small apartment buildings. But they keep the scale and the aspiration, the look of the single family. It's got the lawn. It's got the separation. It has the values. Hidden density from the street, you can't see it. It's in the back. It's the lane cottage. Now, we have lanes, alleys, in the back. That's an important factor. I remember getting a tour of Victoria Park here and seeing how you had to do the side road. And yes, there are these design challenges, but providing this small form of accommodation on what was previously the site of the garage while still providing one space for the car, this is very successful. People love this stuff. Now, we don't allow them to be sold. They have to be more or less built by the people in the main house. Those values are still important. I think that will change over time. But at least initially, we found a way to introduce a more affordable form of housing in neighborhoods that are pricing themselves out of the range of the kind of people who need housing in them. Uh, the irony of it is, is that there's no government that can go out and say, hi, we're actually going to find a policy that will be so successful at providing affordable housing that it will lower the value of your existing asset. Which means that any new housing has to be seen to be affordable, uh, expensive, has to be seen at least to be expensive. And on a square meter basis, is. But it's smaller. It fits in. It provides an alternative. 
again, like transportation, it's about the choice. And then the form of housing that we all jumped right over in the streetcar and the automobile era, uh, that when you go to most eastern cities in North America or Europe, you find it's still a very successful form of housing, the row housing. And here you do get into some interesting challenges about how we've subdivided our land and how we can do it now and how you can provide technically. You can do that. I have no doubt about it. You could actually, the Australian style, adapted to this and the various forms of medium density housing, that could be your brand. And then basically densifying along the arterials. Back again to class. Why would we build the multiple family housing on the least amenity site, the busy road? Because the neighborhood behind sees it as a fence, a defendable place where people not like us can live. I'm brutal about this because I know it's true. The success of my neighborhood is because we built the multiple family housing off the arterial, suburban. And I think eventually we will get there, but initially it's going to be like this. And this works too. You can deal with those noise issues. You can deal with those interfaces. And as our friendly condo king, Bob Rennie, who sells more of this product than anything else, says, today, it ain't location, location, location anymore as much as it is transit, transit, transit. And here's where we're back again, Perth and Vancouver. We're finding our ways to do it. Now, we're a little bit ahead of you on this, so I'm going to give you some examples. How am I doing, Marion? Hmm? Five minutes, perfect. We have established an urban growth boundary. Nature did most of it for us. Mountains and water, can't argue with that. The international border and the agricultural land. Take that out. Uh, basically, it was almost like two-thirds of the potentially developable land. Say, so you've got to do infill. You have to take that seriously. You are going to have to be creative about it. It must appeal to all classes of people. It has to allow for the transition of existing neighborhoods. And we have. 90% of new development has occurred within that compact metropolitan region. And it's been organized around the frequent transit network. Frequent transit network. It's not just about rail, although what you're going to see is basically focused on it. But the entire network, based upon a multitude of modes and information feeding into the trunk lines, that works. The density can be concentrated in the station areas. And that's what happened. So let me show you what that looks like. We had, in 1985, the first automated, quote, light rail, heavy rail, I never know what to call it, grade-separated system, extraordinarily high frequency. If you have to wait more than about 40 seconds for the next train, that's considered to be an excessive amount of time. That's frequent. And what it means is that people want to be near that. Every high-rise that you see in that picture, and that was taken about 15 years ago, is not in the city of Vancouver. Those are in the suburban municipalities, that stuff. And that continues because this product, for two reasons, really works. It's more affordable. It has transportation access so that you don't need to own a car. That point is critical. For the young person in particular, if they do not have to spend eight to $10,000 a year on the car, give them two or 3,000 for transportation. That's the difference between a neighborhood they might want to live in and one they feel forced into where they have to buy a car. So along the original Expo line, right there is this. This is a greenfield site, could be brownfield, but it gives you some sense of the scale of what it's possible to do. There is also jobs related there, and you can see the SkyTrain line running between it. Further out, and this is really important, Surrey, our classic post-war automobile-dominated municipality, made a full and sincere commitment to urbanizing, transitioning from this to this to this. University integrated into an old shopping mall that was dying, both doing great, to this. City Hall in the back, library next to it, major public plaza, private sector development, 50-story condominium plus hotel. That's urbanism. That's a sincere commitment. They moved City Hall from the center of the municipality to right next to the SkyTrain line. Once they did that, the private sector took them seriously. 
thousands of units now clustering in around a true urban environment right at the end of the SkyTrain line. Next line up. If you are looking now for brownfield sites, once you get to the point where you've used them up or you want to keep them for job generating uses, really critical, the most important brownfield sites you've got are your regional shopping centers from the 1950s and 60s. Single ownership, asphalt, parking demand goes down, land value goes up, you introduce the frequent transit, particularly rail, and you can convert to this. What's not to love? No government subsidy. High profitability. Better use of the existing land asset. Here's another example. One of the earliest shopping centers in Canada, built along the Canada line. This is what it used to look like when it was first built. This is the, hmm, no, it's already changed. As dense, better design. Major park in the center. And look at the neighborhood that it's in upper middle class. Accepting of the density because the line went in, transit can remove, in fact, some of the parking demand in the adjacent neighborhood. And importantly, I think this is really critical for you, it's people like us. It's people transitioning from the single family neighborhood into that product, they want to live in the neighborhood. It's people of the same status, if not higher, and it makes sense within the context of the neighborhood, primarily because it's not car dependent. So beginning to repeat myself here for good reason. The lessons are really critical. You can go into suburban communi uh, communities, in this case 30 to 50 kilometers outside the downtown core, and, and do really good product. Here was the deal in this case in Port Moody. All of those neighborhoods up there on the slopes, they didn't want to see more of the same. They wanted to keep their city as green as possible. They wanted to keep those wildlands. And the council said, deal. But we're going to transfer that density into our city core that we want to encourage right next to what's going to be the transit line. Commercial, retail, residential, parking primarily below grade, walkable, well-designed, very doable. Big lesson. If you focus just solely on transportation, you're only doing half the job. Once you've got the land use plan that calls for it and you follow through, there's political courage, and you begin to see the benefits from transportation, a drop in demand, a drop in dependent car use, a drop in parking, a better utilization of that incredibly affordable land for a better use that reinforces the values of your neighborhood and provides people with an option that they wouldn't otherwise have, you got a winner. And it's my belief, having seen Perth over this last decade, you can actually do it better than us. Certainly what I've seen so far in terms of transportation, medium density development, quality of design, amenity, value, you have done it better than us. We count on you, in fact. Because good examples are what we need to show those places that don't think it can be done or are resistant to it, it can make your life better. You need us for the same purpose. Perth and Vancouver, together at last. Thank you so much. I really enjoy being here, as you can tell. Please invite me back. sign of a true professional, he asked for immediate feedback and I gave him a 10 out of 10. Is that fair? I think he just did an amazing job of being a friend to Perth, a critical friend, telling us, you know, in very bold terms what Vancouver's done, what it's done well and what it hasn't done well and the opportunities that Perth has to do it even better. So I'm, I'm so delighted that this was one of the sort of first public airings of our Get A Move On project. How are we going to have a transportation and land use system that's going to make Perth even better than it is now? So thank you very much, Gordon. 
I'm going to ask Pat Walker, uh, so our Committee for Perth and RAC are doing the Get On Move On project in partnership with a number of other organisations as well. And Pat is our steering committee chair and we've already had two meetings of the steering committee, so I'm going to ask Pat Walker to come up and talk a little bit about the uh, project and formally launch it to you. Thanks very much, Marion. Can I firstly um, uh, thank Sean for his earlier welcome to country and also pay my respects to the elders, uh, the Wajuk people, uh, their elders past and present. And Marion, I just got to say, I, uh, Gordon loves us so well that he also likes to take souvenirs, so I arrested the, uh, the control unit back from him. Um, in the interest of time, I'll truncate what I, I did want to say and um, do that happily, and we're going to have a great chance for questions um, shortly. But I can say that Gordon, I can, I can already hear some of our politicians now talking about the, the, the we're starved of fiscal oxygen. I thought that was a beautiful turn of phrase and uh, it is something I guess I wanted to touch on. So first can I say that, um, acknowledge all the distinguished guests, I do particularly want to uh, acknowledge and thank the members on the steering committee, get a move on steering committee. If you've ever got to have a committee, I think it's a fantastic name, get a move on. Many of us who sit and spend our uh, countless hours in, in committee meetings would uh, enjoy that. But it's very relevant and it's very critical for Perth. Um, and I think it's encouraging to see so many people in the room. This is obviously a, a subject which resonates with us all. It's something that we know will really shape the future of our wonderful city. And I think there are critical lessons and great lessons we can learn from uh, Gordon's discussion in Vancouver. And I'm sure uh, Gordon's very happy to be invited back here, but I suspect there'll be 35 people to 135 trying to line up to get an invitation to visit your fine city, Gordon, as well. Um, almost two thirds of uh, Australia's population uh, live in cities and there's about over 80% in Western Australia's case. So we have a real challenge in terms of urban density or a real opportunity in terms of urban density in, in Australia and Perth is no different to that. And I won't touch on, I think everyone in the room is aware of our growing population and the real challenges that we confront and opportunities around how we make it livable and how we get people moving from one part of Western Australia or moving from one part of Perth to another. And as sometimes people say, I think in picking up one of Gordon's comments about our outer suburbs, I think personally I'd say that, you know, people at the moment can might be able to afford the price of a house and land package many, many kilometres from the CBD, but they probably won't be able to ultimately afford to live there because, you know, living somewhere, uh, affording to live somewhere is uh, much different than the purchase price of the original product. It's what comes with that, it's the length of time and, and the sort of the issues that arise uh, and the sometimes we're consigning people to life of lost opportunities in certain parts of uh, the cities we currently design. Perth has a huge uh, infrastructure gap and those gaps, uh, Gordon touched on, they're not just about, and I guess from the RAC it's important to say, we're a proud organisation that certainly 110 years ago was founded on the basis of the automobile. But for many years now the RAC has been talking about mobility, the importance of our people to get around. And of course that's about walking, cycling, public transport particularly, and, and the car as well. But it's all of those solutions. And we have a mobility agenda founded on three core aspects. Safety, which is about safety when we, when we travel, uh, road trauma principally, but that's uh, the vulnerable road users are now getting killed in, in serious numbers. So, so much so that last year, for example, in Perth, there were less people actually killed in road, road accidents or road, road accidents in cars than there were in other modes of transport. So serious issue all around and opportunities there for us as well. One of the things that does differentiate Perth from other capital cities is that we have almost a third of all our people travel more than 20 kilometres every day to work and we have far fewer, as a percentage, far fewer who travel less than 10 kilometres a day to get to work. So we have a very transient, you know, long, long stretches and that's something that we need to factor in and understand as well. Um, we have a funding issue, a funding deficit, and uh, certainly from a West Australian perspective, um, in terms of the dollars and the taxes motorists currently pay um, to Canberra, about 34 cents actually returns. And if we could push that up even to 50 cents or even 41 cents where it was a year or two ago, 
Um, that effectively would almost fund, say, a Thornley to Coburn rail line connection. So, so certainly funding, and uh, that's, that's a system which is broken. And that's something that we're really keen to enter into a discussion about. The RAC actually supports changes to the way infrastructure is funded in this country and in, and in this state. Um, but what we do, we support the work of the Productivity Commission, we support the, re the work of the Harper Review. But what they are both clear about is that a, a movement, a move away to the way we do pay um, for, for whether it's road user pricing, and we think that's probably the preferred, but it has to be an all-embracing policy. So that, that is, it's not an add-on, it's not an additional tax. Motorists in this country are already paying more than their fair share. Um, and we as commuters are doing that, but we do support a change so that we send price signals, so that we alter our behaviour and that we are able to afford much needed infrastructure, largely in the, in the area of, um, of rail, but also cycling facilities and the like. We like to play our part, I guess, um, in terms of emerging technologies. We're very interested and we'll have an announcement um, not too distant future around autonomous vehicles, but you may be aware that we funded electric charging stations, which is, you know, uh, was our way of trying to reduce this range anxiety for electric vehicles, encourage the use of those. And more recently, we um, provided electric bikes to four significant institutions in Western Australia, the university, the QET, QE2 Medical Centre, and the cities of Wanneroo and the city of Perth. And they were very successful trials. Uh, we provided electric bikes, staff were involved with that and we saw significant shifts in the way that people, the, the reliance on, vi on motor cars significantly dropped. So picking up I think Gordon's reference, Perth is a great city for cycling and, for, and, and also obviously electric bikes are a useful adjunct to that for those people who need to travel long distances or those people who are getting a little older like me and uh, need some assistance up into the hill or perhaps pushing into the Fremantle doctor. So. There's, almost, there's all, also enormous adaptation and innovation happening. Car sharing is emerging around the world. We actually think that the, the nature of our travel will shift markedly. We think autonomous cars, they're here now. They will tend to, um, to enter into uh, you know, our car parks and our garages. That'll take a while, but the future will look much different and we need to be aware of that and plan for that as well. But particularly, I'll, I'll stop there um, what I can say is the RAC is really delighted to join with the Committee for Perth. I think both have a proud uh, history of advocacy on behalf of uh, our members and the people we represent. I'm certainly pleased to be the Chair of the Committee and I look forward to working with my committee members on your behalf and everyone else's behalf. And I think the work we'll be doing, which is really about engaging Perth commuters and also businesses in a very practical way that they can contribute to the design and, and we understand their behaviour, their aspirations in terms of an effective public transport network for Perth. So we know our city is growing and changing and I think together we have a chance to, to shape and influence that and I think that your, your attendance here today very much reflects that. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce Sally Braidward. Sally's been doing work on behalf of the committee and the committee for Perth um, in terms of surveying Perth commuters. I think you'll find her her information very interesting and I wonder now if you wouldn't mind joining with me in welcoming S Sally to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Good afternoon. I too would like to start by firstly acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land where we meet the Wadjuk Noongar people. It's really exciting to be here today to share what's a very early first cut of some data that we collected recently among commuters across Perth. We've heard a lot about the context of why this research is taking place. We know that Perth is a city very reliant on cars. We've heard the stats from Infrastructure Australia that if nothing changes by 2030, seven of the country's 10 most congested roads will be here in Perth. We also ran another project for the committee a couple of months ago which was among residents, and it showed that simultaneously public transport is seen as one of the most important elements of our future here in Perth, but also one of our poorest performing areas currently. And so this together really highlights the need for some more research around transport, in particular to understand Perth commuters' behaviour and what's motivating their behaviour and also what their reaction is to some proposed changes to transport in the future. And so we spoke to a little over 2,000 Perth commuters recently, it was earlier this month, that we did the research. 
And we wanted to talk to people who commute at least three times a week to work or study, and people that use one of five transport modes. And so that's car, train, bus, walking or cycling. And so what's the data telling us? We started, what you're looking at now is car commuters. They'll always be in the green colour. And so we asked all commuters, why is it that you choose the particular mode that you do to get to work or, work or study? And what car commuters told us is overwhelmingly, for seven in 10, it's about convenience and speed of journey time. So it's a strong sense that it's more convenient for me and it's quicker than any other alternative I have. About a third also told us that it's less stressful and a quarter report that they actually enjoy driving. That's why they're doing it. If you have a look, six of these reasons that are cited could be classified as fixed factors. And so that's meaning that they're reasons largely outside of any individual's control when it comes to why they're actually driving to work or study. And that means it could be quite difficult to encourage these individuals to change their behaviour. And so these are all marked with a green star, as you can see on the screen. And put together, these impact 51% of the people we spoke to that actually drive to work or study. And so these reasons are having no other viable option, needing to use a car while you're actually at work or study, believing that public transport's unavailable or inaccessible, not having enough parking at train stations, being supplied with a work car, or having a health or mobility issue that actually stops you using another mode of transport. Now, some of these could be overcome with education or indeed with improved infrastructure, but certainly a lot of these can be very difficult to overcome when we get towards trying to change car commuters and get them out of their cars using different modes of transport. We also spoke to public transport commuters, and so you can see train are in the blue and bus are in yellow. And when we ask them why they commute to work or study the way they do, they tell us that it's really about cost and convenience. They're the two biggest motivations for these groups of people, along with avoiding the hassle of car parking at their end destination. And so while the motivations of bus and train users are similar across most of these measures, bus commuters are far less likely to tell us that their journey actually saves them time compared to other modes. So 15% of bus commuters believe they save time by using the bus compared to 56% of train commuters. It's also interesting to note that not having access to a car or not having any other viable option is only a reason for a very small proportion of public transport users. And so it's suggesting that public transport choice use is actually a choice made freely for many commuters. We'll have a look now at walkers and cyclists. So walkers are in red, cyclists are in purple. And for this active commuter group, it's really all about lifestyle and health. That's the prime reason they're choosing to commute the way they do. It's for the health benefit. There's also convenience and cost and enjoyment that are coming into it as well. And again, with this group, it's interesting to note that it's actually less than one in 10 that tell us they have no other option. And so again, active transport's being chosen. It's not being adopted out of necessity. And so that's motivations at a, at a stated level covered off. We also ask, well, what's frustrating about your journey? Tell us what drives you nuts. And so car commuters, again, perhaps not surprisingly, tell us it's about congestion and also roadworks. Only a small proportion, between 9 and 11%, are actually concerned about the availability of parking at their end destination or about cost. And so this is telling us that that financial barrier is not heavily impacting, at least at the stated level, for, uh, for car commuters. Public transport users, it's about overcrowding, certainly for train commuters. It's two thirds of train commuters telling us that overcrowding on the train is the most frustrating part of their daily journey. Around a third are also frustrated by the cost. And very interesting if you keep in mind the extent to which public transport is already heavily subsidised by the government. Bus commuters are also experiencing the same frustrations around overcrowding, but not to the same extent as train commuters. And also bus commuters are telling us it's about reliability as well. So that's late or cancelled services that they find frustrating and also journey times. We'll have a look at walkers and cyclists again. And so for cyclists, their key frustrations around safety and also the availability and quality of cycleways. And so while a, around a third or a little less than a third of walkers also have similar concerns, really interesting, two in five, 41% are telling us they've got no frustrations. So quite a content group of commuters or walkers. And so we wanted to get a sense of perceptions of your journey. So is it a stressful journey or is it a relaxing journey? And you can see on this chart here, the darker red is the stressful end of the scale. So those commuters who feel there's quite a lot of stress associated with their daily commute. And then in the darker green is those who feel it's, it's quite relaxing, extremely relaxing in the dark green. And as you can see, a quarter of commuters report some level of stress. 
and then also nearly half are saying there's some level of relaxation with their daily commute. This is all commuters put together. And so if we have a look at it by the different modes, we can see that there's the most dark green and that's the highest levels of relaxation among walkers and cyclists. And if we combine all the green, so that's all ratings of six out of 10 and above in terms of being a relaxing journey, definitely we can see that net score is highest among walkers and cyclists. And then it drops down all the way to car commuters with just 39% saying there's any le level of relaxation associated with their journey. And if we look at the stressful end of the scale, we can see that highest levels of stress remain train and car commuters, followed by bus, and that stress levels fall completely away for walkers and cyclists. And we also asked commuters whether they felt that journey was actually getting better or worse over the last 12 months. And we can see here that for just over half of commuters, they actually feel it stayed the same. They haven't seen a change in the last 12 months. But 18% can tell us it's getting better, but 31% are telling us it's actually getting worse. And if we look at that across the modes, we can see that between half and two thirds of all the segments are telling us it stayed the same, there's been no change. But the next thing we see is that the modes that are most likely to have seen any improvement are actually walkers and cyclists. And so about a quarter of each group have been able to say it's gotten better over the last 12 months. We can also see that car commuters are the most likely of the mode types to say that it's actually gotten worse. So 15% are at the extreme negative end of the scale, and then another 21% are at the negative end saying it's still getting worse over the last 12 months. So most improvement is among active commuters, and the most deterioration is for car commuters. We can create a bit of a matrix from those two questions and just essentially see where the greatest areas of priority may be when it comes to the actual commuter experience. And what we can see is that relative to other modes, it's walkers and cyclists that are doing the best. They're more likely, again, relative to the others, to say that their commute is relaxing and that it's actually getting better and has gotten better over the last 12 months. And that's compared to car, train and bus commuters who are actually telling us it's getting worse and it's stressful. And so these three groups in that bottom priority group, really, they emerge as there's an opportunity or a challenge around trying to change perceptions of behaviour, perceptions of commute, or the, the way that commute is actually being experienced. We understood from the outset that parking was going to have a, a big influence in terms of people's behaviour, and so we wanted to dig into that, and we've just heard from Gordon the impact of parking and cars across everything we're talking about today. And what we've seen so far is really quite interesting. And so we started by asking car commuters, where is it that you park when you get to work or study? And what we can see is that the vast majority of car commuters, 76%, actually have access to free parking at their place of work or study. And this comes in the form of whether it's free allocated parking, free off-street parking or free street parking. And so that leaves just 22% of all these car commuters who are actually paying for parking at work or study. And that means the bulk of these car commuters, again, aren't being impacted by any potential financial barrier, which could act to change their behaviour and make them think harder about deciding to drive to work or study. We also asked how much people were paying for that car parking they had access to. And we see that on average amongst those car commuters, it's about $9.70 a day that people are paying for parking. And that varies depending whether it's paid street, off street or, or allocated parking. Now we also asked non-car commuters, we understand you don't drive to work or study, but if you wanted to, would you have access to parking at work or study? And the vast majority actually told us, yeah, I do, I could. There is parking there if I want it, but I still choose not to drive. So 79% of non-car commuters have access to parking. What's interesting is that we then said, well, is that parking paid or is it free? And it's the opposite of what we saw with car commuters. So with non-car commuters, the vast majority, 62%, only have access to paid parking. And so this is starting to suggest that access to paid versus free parking is going to have an impact on people's behaviour. We also asked, well, how much is it that that parking would cost you a day if you were to use it? And on average, it was revealed it was about $15.50, which, if you remember, is a lot higher than the rate that was cited by car commuters, which is about $9.70. So that starts to suggest it's not just access to free versus paid parking, but perception of how much that parking is going to cost you that starts to impact on whether you actually choose to drive or not. And so we've got a sense of what commuters are doing now, and there's a lot more we can do with all this data in the next stages of analysis. And so we wanted to get a sense from people 
in an ideal world, what would you actually be doing? Tell us yourself whether what you're doing now is what you would like to be doing in the ideal world. And so what we found is that car is still the most preferred transport mode in an ideal world. Still 39% of commuters said I'd like to be getting to work by car. And then you can see it falls down for cycling, train, walking and bus. And so given that this is the ideal, we wanted to overlay on this what people are actually doing now. And what we can see is that while 39% identify car as their ideal mode, just 32% are currently using car. So that's 7% that are doing something other than their ideal. And the gap gets bigger for the other modes of transport as we go down. And if we look at what people are doing instead, so public transport and active transport for people that would rather be driving, but more interestingly, across the gap of the all, all the other modes, most people are currently driving, but they would rather be doing something different in an ideal world. So it starts to reveal that there's certainly a proportion of current car drivers who would like to be doing something different. And in fact, it's 53% of current car drivers that would like to be trans getting to work or study via a different mode. And so it's a very basic and stated level, but it's telling us that people, there is a proportion that are open to changing their transport mode. And so we're going to, as we move through the, the program of research, there's more to be done to get a deeper understanding of exactly why commuters choose their specific modes of transport. And it will reveal some strategies and initiatives that can be used to change less desirable behaviour, like car use, to more desirable behaviour, whether that's active or public transport use. And so with this in mind, we wanted to show commuters some various strategies and initiatives to get a reaction from them as to how effective they felt they might be in meeting Perth's future transport needs. We showed over 20 different initiatives, and what this is is the top five. And so you can see there's a, a net effective score, so commuters telling us how effective they believe each of these will be. And what's very interesting is that four of the top five are related to public transport. And so in order, so it's increasing public transport services available, making better use of existing public transport services, incentivising commuters to use public or active transport, and providing more park and ride spaces. And this really aligns with what we saw in the previous research we did, that public transport is seen by commuters and residents as a key aspect of our future. What you're looking at now are the, the five least effective or least favoured initiatives. And not surprisingly, these are all the financial penalties. So commuters are telling us they're not favoured. And so these are, come in the form of various taxes, whether it's in road tolls or direct taxes or increased parking fees. So while commuters are telling us we're not going to, we don't believe these are going to be effective, we've already started to see that relationship emerge between access to free versus paid parking and also the cost of parking and the relationship between changing behaviour. So showing these to commuters is not about deciding what should be invested in in the future, but it's more about understanding how any potential initiatives would be received and then how they might need to be tailored in terms of communications to actually be uh, when they're released to the public. And finally, we showed commuters five mode-specific options for the future and asked them to rank one through five in terms of the priority they felt the state government should give each of these initiatives. We then assigned points so we can get a, an overall ranking. And what we can see from the five is that light rail is still very much on the agenda for commuters and that came out as the most supported or the highest priority initiative. And that's providing new light rail to move people in middle and inner areas. It was followed by new heavy rail to move people in the same middle and inner areas. And the third priority was rapid bus to those areas. And you can see the least supported was new uh, heavy rail to outer suburban areas, followed by rapid ferry services on the Swan River. And so that brings us full circle. As we said, it's the, uh, the first step in the analysis. Next stages will be to speak more in depth to people who are commuting and also businesses. So we look forward to sharing more as we have more insight. Thanks, Sally. I'm very conscious that we've been speaking at you for a long time and no doubt you've got pent up questions. So we've got three microphones in the room. Can I have a show of hands of people who've got questions and we'll try and get to everybody. A couple at the moment. So we've got one at the back there, Michael McPhail, I think, if, the, if I can see properly. And if I can ask Pat, Sally and Gordon to join us on the stage. And so for those of you who have questions, if you just let the girls with the microphone, if you show a hand, then they'll actually uh, get to you because I can't see down to the back of the room there.
And Gordon, you get a microphone, all of your own. You won't have to share. Okay, cool. All right, Michael, over to you. Thank you, Marion. My name's Michael McPhail. I'm the Deputy Mayor of the Town of East Fremantle. Um, Gordon, I'm perplexed. Um, all of the stuff you're talking about suggests we need to change the way that we're investing in our infrastructure and the way that we integrate land use into that. Um, but yet at the moment in Perth, we're, we're carrying on the, the previous paradigm of building more freeways and particularly in the suburban freeways, the People's Freeway has been recently talked about. Um, you touched briefly on and hinted that there might be some forces that might be driving that, that paradigm to continue forward. Would you be able to talk a bit more about why you think um, that paradigm isn't changing? It should be on. Path dependence. This is the way we've done it. We're good at doing it that way. They keep giving us money for more of it, and the expectations are there. Psychologically, the association of the car and freedom. Thirdly, we're not prepared to price it. And until clearly, I think that data showed pretty clearly, <laughs> gosh, pricing really works, but we don't want it. And I get the politics of this to say, hi, I'm here to tax you for something you thought you already paid for and you've had for free. Yeah. What I think is going to happen, Pat and I were having a great conversation about this, is technology is going to do the job for us. That, insur that insurance. Uh, the automobile, I think, will have more and more technologies introduced, automated vehicle technologies. I don't think we're going to see the driverless car all that soon, but what we're surely going to see is a lot of advanced technology to reduce risk, collision. It's going to be expensive, and it's going to have very high liability associated with it. It has to be maintained foolproof, 100% all the time. That, I think, along with the insurance consequences of that, are going to mean that people will less likely want to actually own their own car so long as they have access to one under the circumstances that they're prepared to pay for. At that point, the pricing mechanism can be introduced without as much political backlash. And once that starts to happen, the next question is, why have we spent and are spending so much money for infrastructure that it turns out we don't actually need? Where if we transfer this, we can reinforce the virtuous cycle. Add in the land use component, what's not to love? Now, if that all comes together within about the next 5, 10, 15 years, uh, plan for that. Uh, have your expectations ready to go. Do the education. Shift the paradigm. But to just keep building more of the same damn stuff and to give it away for free with no positive model that shows you that that actually works, makes the problem worse, my mind just doesn't add up. So that's where political leadership comes in. More of a question? I can't believe you're all so shy. Here we go, we've got one down here. Uh, g'day. Um, my question's about, it's a bit more esoteric, it's about one-way streets, because I saw, Gordon, in some of your photos that Vancouver seems to have quite a few one-way streets. Actually, right, because uh, I saw a M M something, something street which had the bike lane put in, was a one-way street. And, but to my mind, the best cities in the world, Paris, New York, Barcelona, are run on a network of one-way streets. And Perth is just per turning all its one-way streets back into two-way streets, including one that's going to happen on this weekend. Do you have any comments around one-way, two-way streets? Yeah, yeah. Um, again, we're going to have to be so specific. Portland has 22 feet, what is that in metres, uh, rights of way and one-way streets. Cars move very slowly, but they have the signalling system that allows them to do that. Barcelona, on the other hand, particularly in the Chiampla, has these really wide, high-speed and I think extremely obnoxious system of one-way streets. I think in the Portland case, it works. In the Barcelona case, it doesn't. If you're talking about the maximum access, uh, particularly for other modes, cycling I'm thinking in addition to cars and transit, I think a two-way system with a access system of one-way feeders is probably about the, about the right balance. What I'm saying is, it depends on your city, uh, depends on a number of factors. Are you increasing options and choices without increasing the negatives, particularly speed? Once you get past uh, about 50 clicks an hour, you've got, I think, some real
problems in terms of safety, sound, um, and basically the obnoxiousness of traffic. Another question at the front here, Gail? Thanks, Mary. Gordon, this is a loaded question because I know you wanted to get a quote in, so I'm going to just invite you to, um, to give that information. But the other provocative part is, um, you know, uh, in some of our discussion, have you seen a couple of areas around Perth that have made you scratch your head about almost a missed opportunity? Thank you. Any, any areas around Perth that you might have thought is a bit of a missed opportunity in terms of... Yeah. Here's your assigned reading. I just, uh, great thing about uh, <laughs> having to fly for 28 hours, you can get caught up on your reading a bit. Uh, this has just come out. It's called Street Smart. It's written by a guy named Samuel Schwartz. If that name means anything to any of you, it would be Mr. Gridlock. He's the guy who coined it. Coined it. He was the transportation commissioner for New York City. Uh, it's been a great read if you're into that kind of thing. But here's the thing that jumped out at me the most. I find this kind of boggling, actually. Um, during the 50 years we've been running this very expensive experiment, uh, car dominance, has it been worth it? Are we more prosperous on average than we would have been without spending hundreds of billions of dollars subsidizing automobile commuting? Yeah, subsidizing is a loaded word, but let's face it, people respond to the perception of free. Paradoxically, all that driving seems to be correlated with lower economic productivity. Put another way, the more, quote, inefficient roads are, the more economically efficient are the areas they serve. Here's the root of the paradox. Within the developed world, the measure that seems to indicate the most mobility, vehicle kilometers traveled, is negatively correlated with productivity measures like gross domestic product. What he's saying is that basically, there's a powerful correlation between per capita traffic delay and per capita GDP. And the correlation wasn't negative, but the opposite. For every 10% increase in traffic delay, the study found a 3.4% increase in per capita GDP. Now that's a lot of nerd talk there, but <laughs> I think this may be a receptive audience. Congestion is your friend. Cities are for the purpose of interaction. It's built into our DNA. This attempt to try and provide mobility in free-flowing traffic at high speed, A, doesn't work, no successful example, and B, seems to be counterproductive to economic prosperity. Now, I still have difficulty getting my head around that. I'd like to see more data. It's a Texas A&M study, but it suggests that, in fact, it's time to start thinking smarter and getting better results by looking for all of that other stuff. Options or, or prospects for Perth, uh, I had three questions when I came here. Uh, how did the stuff that you built in the 90s and 2000s work out for you? Stuff I had seen when I first got here? Answer, pretty damn well. Two, were more people walking? Did, could I find more places where I saw that indicator that a lot of factors were working and people walking? Answer, not so much. Haven't seen a lot of it. That leads me to the opportunity. Suggests to me you're going in the right direction, but you just haven't got enough critical mass yet, but you're on your way. Uh, I did the loop around downtown, started here at Adelaide Terrace, just scooted around, checked out East Perth, down along the water, uh, saw Riverbank. Riverbank? Riverside. Looks like you're on your way. Lots of, lots of possibilities happening. So the option that I saw that looked to me the most interesting is what you now have as a hole in this donut. Looks like there's lots of stuff around the hospital, city serving uses, uh, Wellington Square, uh, if I were looking for development possibilities, don't know your planning, why you've done that, but it seems to me in the future, everything that you can do to get in the residential tightly in around the downtown core with the high amenities, the green uh, band around it, all of this active transportation possibility, wow. Uh, if I were coming back in this town in about 10 years, that's probably where I'd be looking. And, and city serving uses and accommodation. You've got TAFEs, you've got the hospital, you've got a uh, whole downtown market here that has to be by service workers. What kind of housing can you build in there to address it? Land costs cheaper, densities higher. Uh, that might be the best place I'd be looking at. Other question? I wanted to ask Pat a question. Was there anything in the survey that surprised you? Uh, 
I was, I was a little interested that probably the, the, the thing that struck me, uh, Marion, was the movement, the potential to move um, commuters into train and, and um, cycling. That seemed to be, you know, one of the opportunities. And then, as always, we're creatures of perception rather than reality. So I think that, that struck home. But I guess we're pretty familiar. We do tend to do a fair bit of researching of our members. So I must say, um, you know, the, the results were entirely consistent, which, of course, was to be expected. Cool. Other questions? I was going to ask one of the local governments who's struggling with this issue of density in the suburbs if they had a particular question. Because that seems to be like the total no-go zone in all the cities that I travel in. Everyone wants to show me their downtown rejuvenated and that's their jewel where they've got their big towers and you know their big pedestrian malls and they're really pleased with themselves but they always say don't go to the suburbs they haven't changed since the 60s and basically what you were saying to us Gordon was they don't need to if they don't want to don't spend your political, don't spend your political capital where you're not going to get a good return on your investment 50 year olds still thinking they're never going to have to move out appreciating values like that way of life don't go there They'll come around. They're going to want to cash out too. They'll be looking for accommodation within their neighborhood. They're going to be looking for transportation options. It's a matter of timing. Uh, and, and so you want to be prepared. Again, there is all the kind of preparatory work, political leadership, right combination, transit choices, you know, hey, repeat, repeat, repeat. But that time will come. Where can you go? Where is that uh, brownfield site, that shopping center, that station area? Where can you go to do a good job that demonstrates to communities that there is a good choice that isn't going to erode the quality that they feel very defensive about? Pat? Yeah, I'll, I'll, speak. I'll speak from some experience, I guess, as having been enormously privileged to be involved with the Subiaco Redevelopment Project from 93 to 98 when I was the CEO there and on the inaugural board, um, the Redevelopment Authority. And that was bitterly opposed by large sections of the community then, um, the whole redevelopment of what was industrial wasteland. You know, there were, there were areas of land which were actually poisoned with the chemicals, etc. cetera. So um, that was a tipping point. But I will say, I'll just make a reflection, having worked in, in local government, and, and um, that the significant redevelopment projects that, of course, uh, Gordon was reflecting on, they all have one thing in common. And I think this is unfortunate someone has a great deal of respect for local government, in nearly all cases, I can't think of one, they happened when the planning controls and the authority were actually removed from the local government and uh, situated redevelopment authorities. And, um, you know, I, I just make that observation. And I think that, uh, you know, um, Gordon's last slide, I think, which was the powerful one, you know, transportation's all about land use planning. You, you, can't, you can't divorce the two and that uh, if we think we can, we're dreaming. Sure, question. I've got one up the back there. Two up the back, actually. Uh, Martin Spencer from the City of Melville. We are um, very much in that space of trying to increase intensity along transport corridors, and very much in that space of having the older demographics who have moved to that area because it's a nice, convenient, quiet lifestyle. Um, and the main issues we have is that distance from that corridor. And, um, but everything you've said has reinforced the way we've been thinking, that uh, if you've got the facts and the figures and can show that you're not catering for that percentage of population that is looking for a smaller house, um, then we've got a way to go to, to get that information, I think, and, and if we can provide that information, it provides something a little bit more definite. I'm going to wander into something I may not <laughs> know enough about. Uh, the excellent study that Committee for Perth did on, on raffles, uh, if I read it correctly, told me there is a political price that you have to pay for the change in scale. It was the height. It, came, it seemed to come down to a difference in two stories. It suggested to me it wasn't about a height at all. It was, it was the symbol. And then once the building was built and they saw who moved in, which was people like them, the anxiety dissipated. Now that might be too much of a generalization,
but it suggests to me that if you're able to, at a matter of timing, get through the political discourse and the pushback, if the product is targeted correctly, reinforces again the values of the neighborhood, and you have enough time for the neighborhood to get comfortable, that's probably what you're going to have to do. Um, there is something I did learn in politics. As the rate of change slows down, people's anxiety about change increases. Sounds paradoxical, but the longer that people have been in a place and the less it's changed, the more they fear any change at all will be a precedent for something worse. Where change is very fast, or it stays steady, they're comfortable with it. So if you've got to go through this anxiety period where change that hasn't occurred for a long time is now suddenly evident, the good news is once you're past that, the community will become accommodating. Now, a few other qualifications to put on that, but I'll, I'll stick with the generalization. And the raffles one seemed to me to be a pretty good indicator of that. And there was another question on that table as well, I think, Georgie. Uh, Scylla De Lacy from the Department of Transport. Um, thank you, Gordon. You basically explained my life for the last six months because I'm manager of cycling and you hit the nail on the head with what I've had to deal with uh, for the last six months in terms of it being very polarised. And yes, Perth is about mammals and we do know that countries that have a lot of cycling for transport have more women than men cycling, which is partly why I was attracted to the role because I'd like to try and get more women cycling in heels. Uh, so, um, I think the point you made about not going into suburbs and dealing with density because it's just a difficult issue for older people, well, I'm already in a suburb trying to build a demonstration bike boulevard, which I think Portland have, and I am coming up against the older generation, and I think you may have answered in the previous question um, some of those issues, but how do I deal with these older residents who are completely anti any change and have fired off a lot of uh, points which are quite relevant and I guess um, do make sense, but which it's just very hard to move them into any place where we can start to even have a conversation. Listen and to the best of your ability address their concerns. Two, find leaders among them, the mammals, who can be your advocates as well within the community. Three, ignore them. Right? At some point, you've got to make a decision. You've got to do something. You've got to move if you really believe in what you're doing. So the same answer, you know, timing is going to be critical. Once they're used to it, identify with it. It becomes part of, indeed, it becomes part of Australian style, an identity of who you are. My God, this, the, <laughs> I didn't show the slides, but um, when I was able to stare over Cottesloe, what so impressed me was not the young Australian. It was the older ones who had adopted a lifestyle of activity and health. Surely they can be your main advocates. Um, there's a fourth thing too, which I've forgotten, but maybe the thing is just to try and take, if there are particularly adamant leaders but are willing to work through things, uh, try and work through examples of success. Uh, again, it really goes back to the second thing, try and listen and, and address what their, their concern is. For those for whom it's just simply change and they don't like it, get out of their way, don't see a need for it, doesn't benefit me, I don't know what you do. Sally, can we um, reflect a bit on the demographic? Um, was there a difference in age group or where people were living in the survey results? There are things you'd expect. So people who are walking, uh, as you'd expect, living quite close to the CBD. There's definitely that band of five kilometres from the city. Active transport is much more likely. Cyclists up to about 10 k's from the CBD as well. Um, and some of the other things you'd expect, so bus popular among younger people, so a lot of students as well as older demographics. Bus really less attractive when it's for a, a longer journey. Again, nothing out of the ordinary. People are telling us what we expect. Um, and train, really importantly, people are taking very, very long journeys on train. But where people are resistant to wanting to take up public transport is where it's just far too difficult to take that first step. So people are telling us if they've got to take multiple changes, they've got to walk for more than 10 minutes to get to a bus stop or a train station, I'm just not going to do it. We're also seeing in the next stages of analysis some really interesting relationships with how many cars people have access to in their household, which really ties into land use and planning and 
infill and how apartment style living or housing in the future might be designed and that people who have access to more than one car in their home are exponentially less likely to use train or bus and much, much more likely to drive for all their journeys. So just having more than one car parked at your house means you're much less likely to change your behaviour and get on a bus or a train. Gordon? I just remember the fourth thing, uh, and it ties into this. You have allies in public health. And you have more and more data to indicate that without encouraging more active transportation, uh, well, uh, you can get the data very easily. It's really astonishing, particularly type 2 diabetes. So by addressing those concerns that older people have, how do I stay healthy? Uh, you're there to help. Uh, a little bit of walking, a little bit of cycling. That can make all the difference. Uh, and I think uh, one thing that jumped out at me in the data was that that if uh, train users' anxiety is about the same as the stress is about the same as cars, where does that come from? Mm. Looking for parking? And if it's a three kilometer trip, that's perfect for cycling. Mm -hmm. uh, if indeed, by doing more cycling, you free up the parking that's creating the stress for those who live in the community, surely that's a win-win. Mm -hmm. So where do you find the win-wins? and your public health people are there to help. Very good point. We've got a question up the back here, and then one down the front and another one down the front. Hi, um, Tim Barling, a councillor with the uh, City of Melbourne. So when you said you went on the, uh, all the lines apart from the Armour line, you, you reminded me of um, Bill Bryson when he was researching for um, his book, A Sunburnt Country, and he came to Perth, and I thought, oh, well, his way of researching the city was to walk from Perth to Fremantle. I thought, that's a crazy idea. What? Who on earth would do that? I can't, I can't dream of doing that. And I can't think of anyone else who would dream of doing that. I don't, think, I don't know anyone that actually has. And I think what he discovered is that, from memory, it said Perth. No, no one walks in Perth. So I was wondering, when you come to a new city, what, what are the simple things you look for when you, when you go around and, um, from, a, yeah, from a simplistic point of view? Thanks. <laughs> All the slides that Marion made me take out of this presentation <laughs> are, are basically the, the shots that I took of Perth. Um, oh God, yeah, you walk around. And, and you take rail, and, and you, ah, here's what I do. I get the local newspaper, <laughs> they still exist, and, and I look for a local issue. Uh, Raffles would have been a good one. I try and find an architectural guidebook or history and I go to that place, and I just walk around, and I try and figure out why is this an issue? What's going on in this community? Uh, often that just gives me just a host of insights, helps me understand the thinking of the people. I, I go around and I look at the people. Oh, here's, some, here's a change that I really noticed between the last time I was here, which I guess was around 2007, eight. You become a much more multicultural city. Now, I come from one. <laughs> Uh, that's probably one of the most diverse in the world. Uh, so I'm real sensitive to that change. What it tells me, you've got students, uh, second language, you've got uh, a lot more people from Malaysia and Indonesia than we have. Philippines, I can see that change really clear. They're probably bringing a set of perceptions about how to live in urban environments that again move you in the direction that we, ha we have gone, that kind of thing. That's just evident to me by walking around, by looking at who's on the train. Uh, just stuff like that. That's what I do when I first get here. And then I talk to people. If I'm, I'm very fortunate. I get invitations from people like you. And, and they're, they have eyes to see and help me see things that I wouldn't be able to otherwise. So trying to find someone like that who can be my guide. Show me things. That's great. It's indispensable. That's what makes you fall in love with the place, by the way. So you feel like now you understand it. You're more part of it. Now we're going to have Steve Barron, Councillor Chen, and we've got this person here with the microphone. So you, and then you, and then you, and then I think we're done. Yeah? Cool. Uh, Gordon Ian Callaghan. Uh, we have several of our universities in Perth who have land holdings close to Perth and are trying with the developments to pursue the types of visions you talk about in Vancouver, but really struggling with some challenges around that. You mentioned Simon Fraser University, but University of British Columbia has some very large land holdings in Vancouver. Um, is there anything you can share about the contribution the universities have made to what has happened in Vancouver? 
I can sure tell you what they haven't done. Uh, and we're still doing it. Oh, God. Universities are these incredible investments, just not in terms of the money that you have to invest in them, but the, of course all of the things that they bring to a community. And, and that vitality that young people bring, uh, the intellectual and social and artistic resources, the research, that should be right in your city. Simon Fraser I'm proud to be part of because we moved off the top of a mountain and uh, took over an old department store, banks, uh, any old buildings that we could get funding for. We became integral to the fabric and the life of the community. And, and we became part of uh, a whole student quarter, Vancouver Film School, technical, English as a second language. We flood the streets with youth. And that's an incredible resource. Uh, and yet we still look for greenfield sites where you can do master planning for single use, literally on the tops of mountains. Uh, Curtin and it looks like um, Murdoch have at least some transit connections, but you know, even just asking people, how would I get to them, uh, wasn't clear. Clearly, they weren't part of the mental maps of people. Uh, so if someone asked me, what opportunities would you bring the universities into the city? Maybe initially some departments, business, uh, arts, architecture. Uh, but get them, flood your streets with youth. Uh, that's just a, any great city has a great university in its core. Councillor Chen. Lily Chen from City of Perth. Um, I think I have to look on the top of the matter before I can ask a challenging question, but I'm not. So what I wanted to say, just to say thank you to Marion and the committee for Perth to bring Gordon to Perth to talk to us. I found the research, um, the talks, uh, the talk by uh, Gordon and the research of Sally and all you guys have done so far is amazing. It's added great value to the state government and uh, the local government's decision making process. And uh, uh, I'm so grateful and also, although I'm so busy with my schedule but each time when you guys send a notice I always be there to support because it's really add value to everything we are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chen. That was very nice. Now I'm going to give Steve Bayer from the Department of Transport the final word. It's only fair. <laughs> um, thank you, Marion. Uh, I've got a question for the panel. Um, the, the results in the uh, survey which Sally ran through, I think are fairly consistent with what we've seen over the last decade in our various uh, household travel page behaviour change programs where about 50% of households are locked into driving or doing the same thing and about the other 50% are looking at alternative or open to alternatives. But um, that's the observation. My question is who's not listening or where's the disconnect? Um, Gordon said forget about the 50-somethings because they're worried about uh, equity in their household before they retire. Uh, there's also a comment about the NIMBYs and those that don't want any change and, and whether you listen to them or not. Um, but there seems to be that either we're dealing with um, a, a transition from the inertia of the old suburban model of Perth, which we're not seeing. I mean, there's certainly demonstrated change around in Perth, especially in the inner parts of the city with very much government-led projects and some um, industry projects. But we still have enormous inertia in the system both from a transport point of view and from a land use point of view. So I guess my question is, is there a disconnect in, in these surveys and maybe it's something to explore through further state of preference work or is there a question of who's not listening or, and our, perhaps our, is the political leadership 10 years behind the, the, way the, the way the city is going? Sally, do you want to start first? I think you mentioned it in there, perception is a really key part of it. So in people's minds, if their perception of public transport is less than desirable, it's something they don't want to do. We've started to look at odds and whether you're more or less likely to use public transport in various scenarios. And if you've never been on a bus or a train in the last 12 months, you're not going to commute by work. 
And so it's just that first barrier, things like public transport to free public transport for various events with your tickets, whether it's football or a music event, free public transport on weekends, getting people back on trains or buses to try it again for the first time can be really beneficial in getting past that first barrier or hurdle of, I did it five years ago and it was horrible, I'm not gonna do it again. And so certainly perception is a big part as we spoke about also, and Gordon just mentioned it in people's minds, the map of how to get somewhere via public transport is an instant. It's not something that's just sitting there and so it's a harder decision to make, a harder step to make, as opposed to I'll jump in my car and drive. It's just easier. And at the moment in people's minds, the ease of driving and that frustration which we saw, 70% of commuters are telling us they're frustrated by congestion, but it's still not enough to tip them towards doing something different. Pat, did you want to comment? Gordon, you go first. Hands up, anybody who does not have a smartphone. Yep, that's what I figured. One person no, one in at the, the back. back. <laughs> the technology is boggling, extraordinary, unbelievable. Uh, we just take it for granted. It's one of the three seismic ways of change. When that starts getting, of course, the technology of the automobile, we've talked about the way you can price road pricing, uh, I think that's going to be seen to be a very crude mechanism for what will become increasingly sophisticated and embedded in the technology. The demographic wave, this aging population and a generational shift, much more adaptive of this technology. And then the third one, no time to talk about this, but I'm pretty convinced it was the third question I have. How seriously are you taking climate change, sustainability, the disruptive effects that are coming are already here. Uh, don't know the answer to that, but it seems to me those three interacting forces suggest to me that the problem is not going to be whether you will be able to move on, uh, have to deal with resistant change. Uh, the future is that you will be re dealing with waves and waves of this. The question is, will you take advantage of it, and how good a job will you do of it? Pat, last word to you. Yeah, look, my comment, Steve. I I think the big thing we've had missing for some time around this whole conversation is plans and a narrative. You know, you, you, you have to bring people with you. And to be honest, you know, where's the narrative about what we're talking about today in the leadership of the, you know, the public policy makers, whether they're whatever level of government they are, where's the narrative? Um, you know, and up until, for example, public transport, you know, up until the current Prime Minister, federal government wasn't even talking about urban public transport funding, which is, you know, a, an interesting thing given it's 2015. So, you know, we, we need plans and a narrative. You know, people will follow you if they know where you're going. But at the moment, you know, who knows where we're going? And, and you, unless you have a narrative, people won't, fo the, people will follow if you explain where you're going and why you're doing it. And I think that is sorely, sorely missed, it, missed currently in Western Australia. And so we eagerly await the transport plan which is due out next year. So my personal thanks to the three of you and David Millican, are you going to come up and, and give the vote of thanks? And I will say at a personal level, I've been the poster child for the one car couple for two and a half years and we've had three fights in two and a half years. I think that's pretty good. Uh, my husband is on public transport more than me but it seems to be working and a thousand dollars a month is now there for European holidays and to put into super. So and pay off our house quicker. So, whereas before it was just you know, younger children doing all that daycare, school drop off, blah, 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 it was a necessity. So it doesn't mean we always have to have two cars. Yeah? Okay, David, over to you. Thank you, Marion. Um, so I have the pleasure of thanking our speakers and bringing our event to a close. And what a great group of speakers we've had. Thank you very much. Um, Sally, I had the pleasure of seeing your presentation earlier this week. And as we said, no real surprises there. Nothing out of the ordinary. But I think what's really good is it's good solid data and it's really useful for us to understand what's happening out there and what people's perceptions really are. And it's important to keep going back and asking that question time and time again. Um, Pat, what I got from your um, brief presentation was that everybody uses transport and whether you're a member of the RAC or not, you might um, have a one car family, a three car family, but everyone uses different types of transport. Um, I guess in a family you might have um, 
the mother who takes her kids to daycare and um, drives there and then catches the train in the city. Um, you have the mammal who rides his bike to work and you might have two kids that catch the bus to university. So everyone's using public transport. Um, it's not just about cars. And the good thing about the RAC, um, it's a great advocate for what we do. Um, it's a good source of information. We can go and ask um, RAC members questions, but conversely, um, the RAC can get out there and tell their members what we're doing and what's important. Um, brings with Gordon, thank you very much for coming. Um, I guess um, I've had the privilege of going to Vancouver twice now. Um, once about 10 years ago when I was a young backpacker and all the partying and things that come with that. Um, but once about six months ago and 10 years older, um, still like a drink, um, but um, definitely enjoyed my time there. And the one thing I noticed um, is that you might have a lot of people who don't drive, but those that do drive seem to have big SUVs. And there are a lot of them, and I'm sure that presents quite a few transport challenges as well. Um, the one thing I talk, took out of your presentation, though, I guess in Perth we seem to do a lot of talking the talk. Uh, we've got a great Directions 2031 um, and Beyond plan, a Perth at 3.5 million, um, which really does a lot of the talking, a lot of the scene setting. So I think a lot of good work has been done with that. Um, but I think where that has to translate is, is to walking the walk. Um, so we have government out here that's saying, hey, density is a good thing, let's work on our activity centres, um, but we really need to provide the transport that goes with that. Um, I'd like to comment about the 4 by 2 um, It reminded me of an article I read in the Subiaco Post, which is one of our local papers that you mentioned just before. And it was a, a guy who'd written in and was saying, I don't understand apartment living. I don't understand how you could get a barbecue to work on a balcony. And now I live in an apartment and my, my barbecue works exactly the same. So um, I think there's a lot of perception going on um, that, yeah, you can still live comfortably in an apartment living and although it's different, it's still, it's still livable. The one criticism, I would, one criticism I would have about Vancouver is, could you please improve your coffee? <laughs> you have this obsession with this drip coffee and you really haven't got onto the espresso yet. Come so. <laughs> um, so, um, thank you, Marion, um, for organising today, and thank you to your team. Um, thanks to Sean for the welcome to country. Um, thank you to all of our speakers. Um, uh, thanks for coming all the way from Vancouver. Um, I'm sure the weather here is much better this time of year, but um, thank you. Um, thanks to everyone in the crowd. Um, thanks for coming along. I hope you enjoyed the lunch. Um, and thank you for the committee for organising the event. And the last thing I have to say, and it's coming to that time of year, I guess, where it's um, exactly one month to Christmas today, I um, hope you all enjoy your summer. I hope you all have a break over, over, the, over the holidays. Um, enjoy the festive season, and we'll see you all in 2016. Thank you.